you can see it. Th thank you, Abhishek. Yes. Yeah. Can you yeah. confirm yeah. you can see my screen? Yeah, we can see the screen, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Excellent. Well, let me start by congratulating Professor Brown for uh, you know receiving the Teaching Excellence Award. Uh, that uh, both Jonathan and I and the Red Hat team, we are honored to be here to uh, speak to this uh, distinguished university and uh, all of you who have taken the time to join us. Um, this is a two-part session, like uh, Abhishek said. I will tell you, in uh, all honesty, the more exciting part will come from Jonathan when he dives deeper into OpenShift and containers and so on. But doesn't hurt to start with a story about who we are, what Red Hat is about. So um, I will give you a quick overview what open source is about, uh, the portfolio of solutions we have, uh, the value of getting certified, and how we actually engage with academic institutions, in fact, like Northeastern University as well. So who are we? We are the world's leading provider of open source enterprise IT solutions. Um, our CEO would actually say we are the world's largest enterprise software company with an open source development model. And you will see what that means in a couple of minutes. The numbers speak for themselves. Uh, the first $3 billion open source company in the world. Um, and so how did we get here? Um, some of you, uh, maybe most of you were not even around when some of the, you know, when you see the years out there, um, we are founded in 1993 and you see the uh, significant milestones. The most recent one being, uh, yes, we got acquired by IBM, uh, but, um, uh, you know, I will tell you that uh, Red Hat is still Red Hat and uh, the, you know, the reason why we were acquired is for the way we differentiate ourselves and you will see why. In a, in a, again, in the next few slides. So what you're going to be, uh, you know, the workshop is about today, uh, this is just to, you know, impress upon you the significance of what Jonathan is going to share with you. Um, the, the product that you see at the top right as a leader, both from a current offering standpoint and strategy, uh, that pretty much puts us, uh, you know, you cannot be any higher compared to, everyone else on this screen. And this is not something coming from Red Hat, it's coming from Forrester. So you cannot go wrong with getting more knowledge about what Red Hat and OpenShift has to offer. Um, so with that, um, you know, whether you pick up the phone and make a phone call, whether you, uh, you know, do online banking or go to the doctor, uh, you know, take an aircraft, whatever, every vertical, there is Red Hat there. So you're actually getting familiar with a company that is you know, impacting our daily life, uh, whether it be behind the scenes, directly, indirectly, we are there in uh, all kinds of uh, industries. So it's all based upon um, the open source uh, community, the open source development model. What does open source mean? So the, you know, when I, there was a time when I used to be on the road and travel and so on before COVID struck and um, I'll be in and uh, you know with the Uber driver and uh, he or she will ask me so what do you work for what do you do and when I say Red Hat some of them actually would even recognize us as oh you're the Linux company but if they don't I would tell them we are like the Wikipedia for software what does that mean that means you have open access to the software that uh, we write we actually are leading contributors in the open source community. When you see the million plus projects, that's not a made up number, that's a fact that is actually going on as we speak 24 by seven with developers uh, are contributing to, you know, because that's what they want to do. They don't do it because they have to, because that's their passion. Now we are leading contributors, in, in fact, the number one contributor to Kubernetes that OpenShift is based on is uh, works for Red Hat. So we don't just contribute there. It is a paradigm where it is not about titles, it is about meritocracy. So you get you the respect you deserve because of your contributions. So we participate, we are the lead contributors, and then when we bring the open source projects into the platform, we integrate them into products. So what's the difference between a project and a product? 
a project, honestly, you know, you experiment, you try, you get excited, you innovate, all of that is good. But you ask somebody in the community, so where is this headed? What's the roadmap? Don't be surprised if you get an answer some that is something like, heck if I know. Um, I like doing this, I'm doing it. But when it comes to the platform that we offer, there is, there, there is product management associated with it, life cycle management, there is a roadmap, there are releases. Um, so we work with our customers. We also work with the uh, open source community to see where the product needs to go. And we drive that, we are the catalysts. Now, when it comes to the platform, we also stabilize it, we harden it, we secure it. So when you are banking, when you are flying, when you are going to the doctor and so on, you want to be assured that you're actually being enabled by mission critical applications that are running on secure, robust, always on software. That's what we do with the software that uh, comes into the Red Hat platform. So what we learned you know, over the past few decades is it's not just about software. It's really about the culture, the culture of collaboration, the culture of transparency where you have access to the code and you collaborate to share problems and also come up with solutions. Collaboration drives innovation. When you go to my LinkedIn profile, that's what you will see. That's the key. You won't see the logo or products or anything. That's the culture. You have to collaborate to innovate. We cannot do it alone. And that actually creates standardization. That's the culture we embrace. And when you look at the, you know, con well, Jonathan will be talking about containers and DevOps and AI, analytics, cloud, all of that. It all started with open source. That's where, you know, it's a fuel for the rapid innovation. That's what we are the catalysts for. So when you look at the products on the left and right, these are the uh, Red Hat products. Um, there is, it all begins, life begins upstream with the open source projects. And there is usually an open source project that is associated with the Red Hat product. So Fedora with Red Hat Linux, um, Core OS with the Red Hat Enterprise Linux Core OX, Ansible, and so on. So that's the model that uh, we embrace. And there is a very rich portfolio. We are, you know, in addition to the very strong global foundation that we have on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, there is, you know, uh, oops, uh, software for uh, the infrastructure across multiple clouds. Jonathan is going to double down on OpenShift to integrate it with applications. And then I would call it the developer's paradise with code ready workspaces where you have a control set of tools at your disposal. Um, and then you have management software that goes across the, the cloud environments. Doesn't matter where you are, you can innovate where you want. That's the Red Hat message. Now, what's the value of getting certified on Red Hat? So if you actually poll the CIOs and we have done that, the you know 65% of the leaders report that skills shortage is really what is holding them back. You know, when Customers and companies, when they say we are a technology company, what are they saying? They are actually, you know, uh, leveraging technology for sound business reasons to, uh, you know, for business differentiation. But you need skill sets to actually, you know, enable those outcomes or drive towards those outcomes with, you know, with those tools. Tools by themselves and technologies by themselves are pretty, you know, stagnant. You have to work the magic. So that's why the skill shortage is uh, one of their key concerns. They lose sleep over it. And the top skills that IT managers are looking for, DevOps, uh, engineers, um, and then Linux being as pervasive as it is, there is a significant chunk that actually seeks uh, Linux talent. Um, this is actually a link where IDC just published the value of Red Hat software certifications, the business value. So this is not, you know, Jonathan and I coming and talking about Red Hat because we work for Red Hat. This is an independent party that is actually making the case for the business value with sort of certifications, not just for the folks who get certified, but also the partners who we work with. So the, the numbers speak for themselves, the differentiation. Um, it's one thing to be just any other sysadmin. It's quite another thing to be a Red Hat certified sysadmin, a Red Hat certified engineer. That logo matters, that stamp matters. And for students, you know, uh, it's all about, uh, you know, ensuring that students are, you know, better prepared to be positioned and placed in the right uh, companies for the right reasons where your skills, 
speak for themselves. Your certifications speak for themselves. And the numbers, you know, you know, 92% with Red Hat training are able to work more independently. 60% uh, are better prepared. Business leaders believe that, you know, just the education system that we have today by itself may not be adequate. And these are all validated by, you know, the links in the reports that you see at the bottom. So that's about certification. Um, a little known fact about you know, how we work with researchers and academic institutions, including, by the way, hello, Northeastern University as well. So in greater Boston, with Boston University, with Northeastern, with MIT, Harvard, uh, University of Massachusetts, all of these, these are the types of projects that are being worked on as we speak. And we are talking faculty, we are talking students, we are talking, you know, postdocs and researchers. That's what we mean when we say, you know, it is not just about Red Hat developers, great respect for them working in the community, they are the champions, they are the leaders, but we also bring academia into it with a purpose. It's not, you know, okay, let's come up with a course and then, you know, or maybe a lab exercise and so on, but building around that, let's have some purpose to it. And that's what you're seeing here. And with the IBM equation, we have now brought in the IBM research collaboration as well. Um, specifically with Northeastern University, these are the projects that are being worked on as we speak. Um, so the open cloud FPGA testbed, uh, deploying end-to-end -end fully virtualized uh, 5G platforms. Um, Mass Cloud is uh, one key initiative in the, uh, in the Massachusetts state. Uh, you know, we are an integral part of that. And you can actually download quarterly reports we publish on these research as well. Um, so how does it, why is it relevant to you? This slide here is actually about, you know, these are live links to theses that are being worked on, internship projects, starter projects, research projects. But when I go back to, you know, um, you, you know where you are in, uh, from a student perspective, you know, what I get excited about is suggesting a project. Hey, what if, why don't we try this? Don't be shy. You can click on the link and suggest a project. And yes, we do have open source project contests as well. And that's what the link is at the bottom right about competing. So um, that's the story I had to tell. Basically, you know, Red Hat in a nutshell is an exciting company that motivates, stimulates, fuels innovation with a purpose. Um, when you go to the research site, you will see that, you know, contact tracing is a project that we are actually working on with COVID and so on that is going on. So it's not just about OpenShift. It's not just about containers and DevOps and so on. Absolutely, that's what we need to double down on, but let's have a goal, a goal where it impacts life, working with academia. So don't be shy. Live Red Hat. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan and I will stop sharing here. Thanks, Nathan. I think that was really great. Yeah, over to you, Jonathan. All right, here we go. I figured it out. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So let me just start this. Maybe you get to see my failure as a PowerPoint expert. Present. Uh, there's a present button on the right top. Oh, you know, I, I couldn't see it because of the. Beside the share. Beside where? I'm sorry. Right. On the right. On the right. The top right. Oh, you yeah. know what? I'm sorry, Just dude. I'm crazy. That. You know what happened? My uh, the the Zoom block was blocking everything. I'm like, I don't see it. All right, I'm sorry. All right, well, that's a great introduction. You know, coming in and falling on my face right away. Uh, I'm I'm Johnny Rickard. I work at Red Hat. I'm a senior architect. Um, I've been here for four years. Uh, just over four years. Um, I specialize in. Uh, cloud automation. Um, I specialize in OpenShift and containers. And um, my job as a delivery architect is to make sure that my customers, when they um, 
purchased a solution that they purchase that they're getting more than just the tech that they bought, right? That they're getting the processes, um, they're getting the the know-how, and um, they're really um, instead of just getting a product, they're they're like it, it's it's becoming part of their ecosystem, and so that's really important to me and, and to the a lot of the people on my team, and um, you know we really just want to make sure that. You know, like when, when you do get into OpenShift and Kubernetes or, or edge computing or cloud or whatever that, you know, you're not just getting this thing that's sitting in, in your data center or sitting out in the cloud and you don't really know how to use it. So um, that's it. So uh, I'm going to go over a couple slides and then I'm going to do a couple of demos. Um, I'm going to show you both OpenShift and Kubernetes because one thing that I'd like to make clear is um, OpenShift is Kubernetes. At the end of the day, OpenShift is enterprise Kubernetes. So to, to Nadam's point about, um, about you know, we, we have a secure production ready environment. That's what OpenShift is. Uh, Kubernetes can be made into that type of environment, but out of the box, um, you know, there's a lot of things that you have to kind of add on that OpenShift kind of comes batteries included with. So if you think about it from, you know, like a, from an analogy perspective, right? Like, do you want to build a car or do you want to buy a car, right? So like the OpenShift has all the buttons on it. It comes with the ingress controllers and all of that already configured. Um, there are certain things that, um, for the most part, like Kubernetes API and, and OpenShift API are pretty, uh, um, you know, uh, like feature parity. Um, but there are some, some key differences in OpenShift. Like we use routes instead of uh, ingresses natively. And we also have um, the way that we build applications to make the developer's life a lot easier. Um, so I'm going to go into virtual machines and containers and then um, just kind of move along. I'm going to minimize this Zoom thing. All right. So in traditional you know, um, IT infrastructure, you know, say 15 years ago, you know, 20 years ago, we had bare metal machines and you'd buy this big, you know, hunk of metal that would, um, you know, it, it'd either be a domain controller or it'd be some web server and is really underutilized, you know, so you fast forward and then we get into virtual machines, which is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a machine, right? It takes all of the, the libraries, all of the dependencies and kernel and it, the problem with the, the virtual machine though is that it still has all of these dependencies, right? You still have all these um, device simulations and stuff like that. And so you end up, you know, it, although you're, you're one piece on top of another bigger machine, like you're still using up a lot of resources that you don't necessarily need. Um, and so now, you know, insert containers and a container is a subset of that, right? So if you think about, you know, installing Apache and a Linux machine, right? You go, like, okay, well, I need, I need Linux. I need to, the, the Apache uh, installer, and then I need some config files and, and whatever libraries I need to interact with that. So that's what, that's what the container is. And it's, it's a bundle of all that software in a, in a small image. And it sits on top of the hypervisor uh, and, and, and is, it, it, it only runs that, that specific process. Now, the cool thing about containers versus virtual machines is that like you get this isolation built into it. So um, there's things called C groups and then you have uh, namespaces and, and those kind of keep those, those containers, you know, in their own little, in their own little box. So they can't, you know, by nature, you know, um, intersect with each other unless you allow it. Um, there's a couple different runtimes that are out there. A lot of the popular ones are like uh, Cryo, uh, Docker Engine is, uh, is probably the most popular one. Uh, and then the one that Red Hat has moved to recently is called Podman. And Podman is essentially a, uh, it, it's pretty much Docker, right? It, it's it just the way that we interact with the, the runtime is we don't use root. So all of our containers are able to run as a regular user where a Docker container needs that root privilege to run. Um, when you start getting into things like, you know, protected ports, so anything under 1024, you're going to need to run it as a privileged container or, or modify SC Linux in some way to allow that through. And that click. All right. So like I was saying before, with VMs, you get the isolation of the VM, but it's a complete OS. It's static compute. So like your memory and CPU and storage, like they're there, um, you get all of that all up front, unless you do like thin provisioning for the storage. But for the most part, like CPU and RAM are uh, you know, they're, they're they're allocated right away. And then it's a high resource used for low uh, consumption, you know. So you might have, you know, four gigs of RAM and two vCPUs or something like that allocated to a web server that's only hosting files that get accessed every once in a while. And so you've wasted all that extra resource that could be going to something else. And a container, you get the isolation, you're using a shared kernel, it's burstable compute, burstable memory, uh, overall low resource uh, usage. So it, it kind of, um, when you think of it just from a resource consumption perspective, right, it really, it really boosts that. 
Um, and then the, the thing that makes Kubernetes and OpenShift like just amazing is the fact that now I can take this little bitty pod or this little bitty container that I had that's running my Nginx server and now I can scale. But what happens is like, um, you know, like to, to traditionally do this, I would have to add a node, add it to the load balancer and do all these things to kind of get that, that, you know, that new device added in or that new machine added in with Kubernetes. Uh, it's all built into the API. So, um, you know, you have, you, ha you have the, your machine and then you're like, Hey, you know what? I need to scale this up for whatever reason. So you just scale it up and what it does is it adds it in. And then um, we'll get into a little bit more on the details, but like what happens is the service does all the load balancing for that and then allows all the access to the individual containers. Um, you have redundancy uh, location. So the, the cool part about this is like, um, if I have a GPU or something like that, so say I've got like an AI ML workload, um, I can with labels say, hey, look, I want this, this pod to start up on this node and use this GPU based off of labels. Um, so I can, I have a lot of uh, insight, not insight, but I have a lot of control over the placement of where my resources are going throughout the cluster. Um, and then the allocations of resources, so the CPU and memories, so you can define, uh, in, in, and as a cluster administrator, you absolutely should, you know, especially if you're gonna have a multi-tenant environment, um, define the amount of, of resources that a pod can use. Like you can, you can define the, the amount that it can even ask for, and then you can set the limits of what it, what it can actually get. Um, and then health monitoring. And so you have, you know, like, hey, is my pod up? You know, is, and, and by up, does that mean that it's just alive or, um, you know, or what's happening, you know? So like that's with, with regular virtual machines and, and regular containers, you, you have to write all these tests. And so with, with OpenShift and Kubernetes, a lot of this is kind of built in, right? So you can say, hey, look, I, go tell me if this pod's ready. You know, so if it's responding a certain way. And then as that pod's alive, go out and check it periodically and make sure that it's still responding the way I expect it to. And if it's not, kill it and spin up another pod. And, and, then, and, that, and that's what makes it awesome. So it takes a lot of the, the human out of interacting with the, the cluster to keep an application running. Um, and then there's this concept of deployments and then you have rolling and recreate. And so when you think about this, a rolling deployment means that, hey, I've got my, my, my services up I'm presenting a website. I've just put, you know, like version 1.1 out. So what, it, what happens is 1.1 gets spun up, does, goes through and does all of its validations. The readiness check comes in and does its, it sets the probe and checks the probe and makes sure that it's ready. As soon as it says, hey, I'm ready to go, it kills 1.0. And then it'll scale up to however many you had scaled after that. Um, a recreate is where, um, say if I have the same, same uh, scenario, I have 1.1, but instead of letting this one come all the way up, for whatever reason, um, you just say, you know what, kill it and then spin the new one up. So I'm just going to start fresh. So you have, you have some flexibility in how you deploy your applications. And that, that's really like this, this stuff is like, it's super awesome. And I'm, I'm only like scratching the surface of what you can actually do. All right. So now I'm going to go over some OpenShift and uh, Kubernetes core concepts. So a container is the smallest compute unit. Uh, and you know, a container, like I said before, is just an encapsulated uh, image, right? So it's got all these different layers. And then as we, as we use that container, we'll, we'll generate a writable layer on top of that. And then if we decide that, hey, you know, we don't need anything, we'll just kill the container and it's gone. So it's completely ephemeral. Um, if we do need to write to it, then we can save that off and that layer gets added into the image. And then we would just reimport that image into our registry and then scale it out or distribute it out rather. Um, so you have the image and then you have the, the container runtime, right? So the, the image is like, um, you know, like your base, right? Your core. So this would be like a rel image or say you have Nginx. So this could be like uh, rel with Nginx installed. And then the runtime, the container runtime is like your Docker or your cryo or, or Podman. And so what you would do to get it to run on this runtime is you would do a Podman pool or a Podman run uh, and then point to the image. And then what it'll do is it'll pull the image out of the public registry, or if you have an internal registry configured, it'll pull that down directly and then run that, that service or that pod. Um, and then an image registry is, it's, 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 if you're familiar with like uh, package registries, that's exactly what it is. It's the same thing for images. Um, it keeps images in this registry based off of uh, product or uh, repositories and, and tags. So um, just a second ago, we were talking about version 1.0 versus version 1.1. So that would be a tag on the image in this registry. All right, so in, in Kubernetes, the smallest, the, the, the smallest compute 
item is, or the smallest compute object is a pod. And a pod is one or more containers, okay? So um, typically you'll see that, you know, there's usually one pod per container. There uh, occasionally will be more than that, but by and large, most times it's, it's a single, um, you know, purpose-built container inside of a pod. Uh, you can see over on the right here that there's two, two containers in this. A lot of times you'll see two when you're trying to do something like a sidecar, uh, which is where, um, you know, say you have a, a server up and you, you need a way to get like the logging information off of that. So you could use a sidecar, they would share a volume underneath and then it could pull that information out and then expel it to another source. Uh, and then you have replication sets. Uh, well, replication controllers in this case, the newer, the newer verbiage is replication sets. But um, what this does is it just says, if I'm supposed to have three pods up, you're going to have three pods up. That, that's just, that's, that's what's going to happen. And so it goes out and it, it just kind of polices the API and makes sure that like, hey, if I, I my replica set is three, so I'm going to have three. Um, if one of those pods dies for any reason, it will spin that a, another pod up based off of the deployment, all the, all the, um, the information that's in that replica set. And then you have deployments and deployments are really like a definition. So let me, I'm sorry, I'm gonna back up a little bit here. You have deployments and deployment configs. So deployment config is very OpenShift specific and a deployment is universal across Kubernetes. Um, there's, there's, a, uh, there's an actual item in our documentation. I'd have to find the link for you that kind of gives you the, the, the reason why you'd use one over the other, but 95, you know, nine out of 10 times you know, you're, you're only going to use a deployment or you're just fine getting away with a deployment. Um, but a deployment is, it, it's the, it's the declarative um, representation of your application, right? So you're saying, uh, I need to use this image. I want to use these replicas. I want these labels in place. Here's my build strategy or my deployment strategy. And so you, this is where you would add in like volume information, any physical volume claims, any, any type of like information that you want Kubernetes to know, like, Hey, this is what I'm expecting. Uh, because at the end of the day, Kubernetes is uh, declarative, right? So you say, uh, hey, I want, I want to be this way. And then Kubernetes just goes and figures it out. And then we have uh, these resources called daemon sets. And so daemon sets are um, services or pods that run on each node, right? So like in, in uh, a good example, of this would be like an ingress controller or, or not necessarily an ingress controller, but like a, uh, like an SDN. So software defined network controller or container, sorry. Uh, what happens is it would get scheduled on each one of the nodes that are um, associated to the cluster. So that way the, cl the cluster will have a, a means of communication. Um, Damon said you'll also see these uh, with, you know, certain things like uh, logging and metrics, you know, something that needs to kind of it needs to pull resources from the underlying host to get information back to, to use as a metric or, you know, to know if the, the cluster is healthy or not. Um, and then we have config maps and config maps are just a way for you to pull the configuration out of the, the container or the deployment itself. And so why this is important is because what we want to do when we're writing these applications or when we're building these things is we want this to be able to go, I want it to go from Johnny's cluster to, to Nadim's cluster to, to Jeff's cluster, right? To your cluster. Without, without a whole lot of interaction. And so that's where config maps kind of really, they help out because you can go in and you can define your cluster information. You can define anything that's kind of specific to your environment into this config map. And then you can mount it into the container as either a volume or as an environment variable. And then spin your, your image up or spin your, your, uh, your pod up and then have your application be set. Um, and then the next thing is secrets. And so secrets are the way that we pass um, you know, passwords and stuff like that. So another thing, another use for secret is passing uh, like TLS certificates. So say if I have my, my uh, server's private key and the CA and it's public cert, I could put those into a secret. I'd base 64 encode it and then apply it. And then I could mount it in as a volume or, or, or um, you know, set it in to the, the container to be used. All right, and then we have services. And so the services are, um, these are key, right? So a service is essentially like, it's the ringleader for, the, for your application. So you set up the service, he knows where all the pods are, he knows all the information about them, right? So if, um, I'm, uh, if you look down below these pods, you have the different IPs, so that means that they're on different hosts. So what the service does, it says, hey, I know, come on in, you know, if you're coming into you know, the backend service, right? You're gonna go talk to this pod, you're gonna go talk to this pod. When we start talking about 
um, let me not get too far ahead, but the, the service is, it's super important when we start talking about like um, getting access into the application. Uh, you can also have this thing called a headless service, which is when we're trying to do like a service discovery and we want to go out and we want to, we want to probe the environment or we want to use something that's in our environment and use it internally to the service. So, or to the cluster and, and something that's um, like a good example of something like that is when you have like a satellite server or a yum server and you you've got like this build process, right? And as part of your build process, it does like a yum update or, you know, an app get or whatever. And so you could have that service configured to where it will go out, use that service name, talk to that, that yum server or that, that uh, package server and then pull everything in. Uh, and this is just showing that like the pods, they can talk to each other via services, right? So um, like, it, it's pretty cool how it all works. Like they, um, when the pod needs to request something, it, it'll reach out talking over the, the cluster network. And then the service says, hey, I know where that is. And then it'll, it'll route the traffic in. Um, and then we have routes. And in Kubernetes, this is the other distinction I would like to make here. So routes are very OpenShift centric. Um, the, the Kubernetes way of doing this is called ingress. Um, but they are essentially the same thing, but ingress is used just a different API and they're, they, they handle things a little bit differently. Routes can, um, you know, routes natively handle uh, TLS where ingress is, they just started, um, I don't know the exact time frame, but they just recently started uh, using the TLS uh, built in. So, but routes are how you access your application from outside. So if I stand up this application in my service or in my cluster, I would expose the service and then I would define a route. And then what will happen is when I say, hey, look, I need to get to appprod.mycompany.com, I would hit that. DNS would say, um, you know, my app or appprod.mycompany.com is actually this load balancer's public IP. That load balancer will route down to the uh, HA proxy inside of OpenShift, which will say, hey, I've got this header for this application. And then it points it to the service and the service says, hey, I know how to do this. And then routes it down to the pod for um, the display or to, to uh, you know, show the app. And I know I'm flying through a lot of stuff and I'm sorry, I'm just trying to make sure that I cover everything because the demos are gonna be hopefully hopefully cool. Um, so the other, one of the other primitives are like persistent volumes. Um, so a lot of times we have stateless applications and that's perfectly fine. The, the app can come up and we don't, we don't really care about, you know, any of the information that's running. Uh, it could just be, you know, some, some front end and then we're really pushing all the, the stuff that we care about, you know, to the database. Um, or to, to an app server and then that's talking to the database and that's where all of our stuff is. Um, but sometimes we want our application to have state. And so that's where these persistent volumes come in. And so persistent volumes and Kubernetes can use all types of storage providers. So um, if you're in AWS, you can use GP2 or EBS. Uh, GCP is like their standard volumes, you know, Ceph, Gluster, local disk, if you wanted to use that. Uh, so all these things, and those are defined in the storage class. And um, what that does is it makes this this provisioning of these resources. So you say, hey, as an application owner, I need to, I need to maintain some state, right? So I, I would make a claim and I say, I need this, you know, the permissions that I need on the, on the uh, claim, here's the size. And then, um, and here's, here's the, the type of storage that I want to use. So if you have like, um, you know, you know, gold, silver, and bronze, you know, storage tiers, right? You could say, hey, I always need gold level storage for my, my, uh, my web app that, you know, host like a, you know, text file for somebody to be used every once in a while, but I need the best storage all, of all, all times. What that does is it interacts with the API and it creates a PV or persistent volume. And then what that does is that interacts with the underlying system and it'll either generate that, that uh, local disk or that, that resource on the disk, or it'll go out to the API and it'll talk to the cloud and it'll, it'll provision that EBS volume or that S3 bucket or whatever it is that you're using. And then it mounts it into the pod. And then, so when, like when you were to log into your pod, you can actually go to that mounted directory and see the, you know, like that you had state and that when you killed the pod and you brought another one up based off of that deployment or replication set or whatever, it'll still mount that volume in. And now you have consistent volume in a stateless application. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the developer experience. And, and this is where I think that OpenShift has really, I mean, like we, we have gotten so good at this and you know, we've taken a lot of input from um, a lot of customers and uh, just the, the interaction with OpenShift itself has gotten so much better um, that it, it is just, it's awesome to use. 
Um, so the way that, you know, a high level workflow is you're going to deploy your source code. You know, you'll put that in Git and then, or you can deploy your own binary or you can bring your own container image, right? So like there's all these different ways that you can, um, that you can get your application in the cluster and it's not a one size fits all. It's, it's, you know, kind of whatever, whatever makes you feel right. Right. It's if, if you're comfortable deploying your own source code and running through the entire pipeline, it's totally fine. We have this capability called S2I where we have a base image and then you can apply your code to that. And it, you essentially start at that base image and then it will build that uh, your, your code into that image and then redeploy it off. It'll push it into an internal registry and then um, you'll be able to reuse it over and over again. Or if you have your own container container image, you've written your own Docker file uh, that does everything that you need it to do, and you don't need to change anything, you can just deploy that in here as well. Um, something that we have done extremely, like something that we put a lot of focus on is, is CI, CD, um, GitOps, DevOps, you name it, right? Like it's, we're, we're, it's, it sounds like buzzword bingo, but we're really trying to get like all of these, like, uh, processes and mindsets like built into the product. So that way you can go from keyboard to tool to production, right? It, it's, it's all about making uh, the developer that much more efficient. So that way they're not worrying about all these other things that happen down the line. They can commit their code, push it into a CI pipeline and then let it go. And then, and then have the CD aspect of it, push it out. Um, and then as, as part of that build chain, you know, deploy, any artifacts that come out, like any ears or wars or whatever that come out of this, push it into an artifact repo and then, you know, pull it back in when it's needed. Uh, so it, it's pretty awesome. Right now, the, the main one that we use is, is Jenkins. And um, there's one called Tekton that I, I believe it just GA, I'm pretty sure it just GA, but it might, it might still be Tech Preview. Um, but Tekton is it's a, it's a CI tool that we have that's built in. And um, it's called, the, the product itself is gonna be called OpenShift Pipelines. And so it's just meant to help make this, this interaction in this, in this diagram that much easier. And then this is just another picture of like the, the, continue, the CD pipeline. So, you know, you, you, you're a developer, you push to Git, it goes into your build and deploy uh, CI pipeline, ends up going into like a Nexus or whatever, and then goes through all the different testing and then gets promoted and then you're in production. So the idea is that when you're, when you're writing code in this first phase of your pipeline, you, well, obviously it's gonna work the first time because we just wrote it, right? We know our stuff's perfect. It's never gonna have any problems. But for that guy or girl that comes in behind us and they write their thing, when it goes into the pipeline, it, you want it to fail there, right? You, you wanna find out that you had a typo there instead of pushing it into production and finding out that you have a typo and then you know, everything's crazy, um, which is what we see a lot. You know, and it, it's kind of sad. Um, these tools and these processes and these workflows, this is, this is like when I was talking in the beginning, I know I've said a lot since then, but uh, when I was talking in the beginning about the mentoring, right? This is, this is kind of that vision, right? And it's not a one size fits all, it's not cookie cutter. You know, it's, it's how do we get you to this? Like, how does this fit where you are? And then, um, and how do we tune this and, and make this to where you're gonna use this every day? and get in this workflow. So that way you, you can fail faster and you can be in production faster. And you know, you can have all of these things and capabilities without the fear of, uh, you know, like you're, you're holding your, you're covering your eyes when you hit submit to see if it fails, you know, like you, want, you don't want to have that anymore. You just want to be, you know, extremely confident. Um, and so just some resources. So if you're interested in trying out Kubernetes, um, you don't have to install a cluster to do so. There's this thing called Minikube and you can install it locally on your laptop or your PC, whatever you have. Um, I don't, it works on a Mac and it works on my uh, Fedora machine. So I, I pretty much, I expect it works pretty much anywhere. Don't know about Chromebooks, um, uh, but yeah, all the information you want to know about Kubernetes is on kubernetes.io. And another important one is that, you know, you have Kubernetes and then you have like the ecosystem, right? The, the community around Kubernetes that makes Kubernetes all, awesome. Kubernetes by itself is awesome but like all of these resources and this big umbrella that like make up the rest of the, uh, uh, you know, the community is just amazing. And that's CNCF and um, just go out there and just check it out. There's so many projects out there and they're all doing really awesome stuff. And uh, you know, it's just on a daily getting better um, for some OpenShift resources. 
there's code ready containers and it's essentially mini cube. So we used to do like, it's, it used to be called mini shift with open shift three, uh, but we've gone to code ready containers. Um, so you can run an open shift four, you know, localized machine uh, on, on your laptop or computer, like just like mini cube and then run open shift level or type resources there. Um, all the information for OpenShift is at www.openshift.com. And then the blog is blog.openshift.com. And the reason why I mentioned that is because um, we have architects, developers, consultants that are going out in the field and they're figuring stuff out and they're learning things about the product and, and they're, they're actually giving that back to the community. And so you can go into this blog and, and see some of the things that people are doing and, and like really get an idea for how powerful the tool is. Um, if you want some hands-on experience without having to install anything locally, I recommend going to these websites. So um, demo.openshift.com is more of a, um, it's more of an environment that has like, like demos that people have done. There's some access to certain things, but the, just to, it's more of a like, hey, here's, here's what you could do with it. Um, Learn.openshift.com and the, uh, the next two are, they're all uh, Katakota based, which means they, they'll spin up a container you can do your thing in there and then like they kind of give you some targeted uh, lessons. So for hands-on experience, it's not bad, especially to kind of, you know, dip your toes in the water and get an idea of this is for you. A um, couple shameless plugs since I've got all, since you're all paying attention uh, is there are some events coming up. So we have Ansible Fest. Um, and, and one thing that uh, not in it said that I, I, I actually wrote it down so I, I wouldn't forget, but um, you know, one thing that Red Hat does is if we buy, uh, you know, if we, if we acquire a company, right. And they have a closed source product, we open source that product eventually. And, and a perfect example of that a recent relevant example of that is Ansible tower. So we, we bought Ansible, they had Ansible tower, it was closed source and we open sourced it. And so, you know, now we have tower and we have AWX as an upstream project. So just, just a real world, you know, relevant example of, of, um, you know, red hat, uh, commitment to, uh, open source. Um, but Ansible Fest, it's, it's all things Ansible, all things automation with Ansible. It's, it's a great time. If you're into automation, it, there are just all kinds of um, seminars and things that you can listen to. And it, it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, KubeCon is uh, in November and it's, it's essentially the Kubernetes summit. You know, I mean, like all of these, all these projects, you know, the, um, the projects that I was telling you about that, like they're part of this ecosystem. You know, a lot of them are going to be there representing and showing how you can use their, their tool to do whatever, you know, if you're AIML focused or if you're tracing focused or whatever. Um, and then some certification info is the DO 180 and 280. Those are both OpenShift. So the 180 is a preliminary exam, but it, it's essentially like an intro to containers um, using Podman and, and doing a, like some basic things in OpenShift. And then OpenShift admin and app dev are really just, you know, building OpenShift clusters and then putting applications on them and building applications on them. And then finally, the last two are CKA and CKAD, which is the uh, Kubernetes admin and the Kubernetes uh, app developer, which is essentially 280 and 288, but for Kubernetes. So that I'm going to stop sharing my screen for just a second and then kick over to Does anybody have any questions? I know I talked really fast, but I wanted to make sure that I, I covered everything. So I don't know if there's any questions really, really quick. Uh, I just um, wanted to add something to uh, what you said, uh, Jonathan, towards the end. You know, I, I go back a few months and when I look at all these conferences, one of the challenges we, I used to have is, you know, traveling to that location to experience it. Now, everything, including this event is virtual. So all the, you know, the KubeCon, the Ansible Fest, it's there for you to attend. And um, most likely, I don't, I don't think there is a fee for attendance. Uh, you you got to go and check, but more likely than not, these are available for everyone. So it's a fantastic opportunity in the virtual world we are living in today for, uh, you know, the students at Northeastern to take full advantage, something that may not have been as easy last year around this time. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, so we're going to have a Q&A session at the end, uh, Jonathan. So once you're done with the presentation, uh, we've kind of told all the members to have their questions noted down. So. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. So I'm going to do um, a really quick demo in OpenShift, and then I'm going to do a, a demo in Kubernetes. 
Um, but I'm first gonna try. I'm gonna try this again. All right. Share. Okay, cool. So um, as you can see, um, I'm logged in as myself and to a, uh, this is a shared Kubernetes cluster, or I'm sorry, a shared OpenShift cluster. Um, so one of the things that, you know, with OpenShift 4 specifically, you know, we, this is our user interface. So as, as um, you know, the cluster comes up, the, one of the last things that, that happens is the ingress controller, uh, the console checks into the ingress controller, the service gets exposed. And like, then, then you get this. Um, we can integrate with SAML, so SSO, uh, Active Directory, LDAP, like your standard, you know, authentication things. One of the cool things, and I, I can't show you everything because I'm not an admin, but just I'll just kind of click around here. But like in OpenShift 4, we've really moved to this operator framework. And an operator is essentially, it's a pod or an application, but it's got this reconciliation loop inside of it, right? And so what that loop does at a very, very high level is it essentially goes out and says, hey, you're supposed to be in this state so I'm going to come back and I'm going to check and make sure that you're in the state that you're supposed to be in. And if you're not, I'm going to, you know, take you down and I'm going to put you back in the state that you're supposed to be in. And so what that does is that, that, that builds in like this, this uh, health and this, this ability to keep your, your application running all the time. You know, so like there could have been a network blip or there could have been some hiccup with storage or whatever. If there's a problem, that operator is going to catch it and it's going to reset you. And then it's going to get that service back online as quickly as possible. Um, when there's upgrades to an application. So like we are talking earlier from, you know, version, you know, 1.0 to version 1.1, if there's an operator, depending on how you have your, um, your update policy set up, you know, if you have it set to automatic, as soon as it picks up that update, it's going to upgrade the operator. And so it, it really takes a lot of the, you know, like the, the things that we, we spend a lot of time doing that we probably shouldn't be spending so much time doing. It takes a lot of that out of, um, you know, out, out of the day-to-day -day stuff. So that way we're only deploying our apps and we're only worrying about our workloads and, and not really anything else. Um, so looking at the UI here, we have, um, you know, this administrator view, which this is, it, it says administrator, but it's really a very limited administrator. Like you, you have the menu and there's some things that you can see, but like there's just not that much there. Uh, but the one that we're, we're gonna focus on is the developer view. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna, um, you know, create, a new project and I'm going to call it demo. I'm going to call it Johnny RJ demo. So I don't have any naming conflicts, hopefully. All right. Oh, this kills me all the time. There's no underscores. There we go. All right, cool. So now, you know, just, just at, from a project level, right? Just from a, 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 a workflow. So all we've done is we've created a project. There's nothing there. You know, we've got basic resources. Uh, there's nothing really going on in here, you know? So just as a visual though, right? You can see where, you know, this is kind of like, hey, I, I've got pretty much all the information I could need in this, in this set. So let me, let's start building some stuff. So let's do from catalog. All right, so what we can see is we're gonna use a source to image application. So what I was telling you before where uh, S2I is this base image that we're gonna build from. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna add our source code into this image and have that built as one. And it's gonna essentially be repackaged and then distributed out. So, you know, just gonna use the example, uh, get repo there, we're gonna give it a name. Well, actually we'll just let it name it. And then um, finally, what we're gonna do is we're gonna expose the service. So when this when this runs all the way through, it's gonna pull the image down. It's gonna apply our source code to the image. It's gonna push it into the internal registry inside of OpenShift. And then it's going to build out the pods and the deployment and the services. And uh, it's gonna generate a route based off of that service, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, off of that service. And then we'll be able to get to it. So we'll click create. And this is something new in, in OpenShift 4. And I, I, I do, I love this. And I'm a fanboy too, so it's easy for me to sit here and get all excited about it. but. 
you know, like now you've got this, this interface and you get this cool, like, you know, little uh, graphic that shows you where everything's going or how, how everything's doing. Um, and then when you have, you know, a, a big project with a bunch of microservices, right? You can actually see how they're all kind of connected. And then when you have something like a service mesh that sits on top of that, you know, then you can really see like, like really, really how they're talking. And it, it's just, you know, from a visual perspective, it's, it's pretty awesome. And as you can see, like we're, we're going through a deployment now, this is the application. And then uh, I'm going to come over and I'm just going to look and see what's going on. So, yep, still building. And so just going through the different logs, you can kind of see, and this is where I was talking about with OpenShift pipelines. So we can create a pipeline. Uh, so it is, it's still tech preview. Okay. Um, but you can create a pipeline and then start working that into your, your, your workflows. Um, we have Helm. So in, in, in four dot, on the roadmap, you know, in the next, hopefully in the next release, I believe. Um, but if not this one, then the next one, they're going to have Helm 3 support. So that way, you know, if you're using the Helm charts that are a little bit uh, older, you know, you'll be able to you'll move them over. If you want to go with the newest, the latest, the greatest, then Helm 3 will be out pretty soon. All right. So got our little green check mark here. So the app is all the way up. So we can see that it went through a build. Uh, we, we have a service now, and now we have this route. So just like that, with a few clicks and you know me typoing a bunch, we have an application up. So like I, at the end of the day, this this isn't like the you know the end all be all, but it just shows you the capability of like just how quickly you can get an application going, uh, you know, inside of OpenShift. Um, and then I'm gonna see. We'll see if this other one works. I'm gonna run it from Kubernetes. I was I'm trying to write it with. Uh, I've been trying to get fancy and write this in. Um, using customize and uh, we'll see if I can repeat what I've done. So share again. Okay. Is that clear or do I need to um, make it a little yeah. bit bigger? It's good. Okay. Cool. Uh, maybe a little bit bigger. But... Okay. Maybe if I click in the right window. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So what I've done is I've pulled down this project. So it's called Ghostblog. Ghostblog is a uh, it's just an open source you know content management system. Uh, so uh, went out and then uh, wrote a deployment. So just to kind of give you an idea of what a deployment looks like. So like I was telling you before, this is a declarative state, right? So we're telling we're telling Kubernetes what we want this to look like. Or here's how we want it built. And Kubernetes is like, all right, got it, and then it goes and it, it builds it, right? Um, so we're gonna do one replica with the app label uh, ghost blog and the namespace ghost blog. Um, and then, you know, just gonna use this, this uh, URL with this volume. So we were talking about persistent volume claims, PVCs. This is what I was talking about earlier. All right. So, because I started breaking this out and to customize, um, this kind of helps visualize the flow in which we're gonna go. So it's gonna create the namespace, then it's gonna create the PVC, the persistent volume claim, and then we're gonna spin up the deployment and then create a service and then an ingress. And this, this cluster issuer underscore prod, this is so I can actually get like an SSL certificate using like a cert manager. Um, and then the ingress, you know, if you notice just going from OpenShift to uh, Kubernetes, you know, like the route was kind of built automatically. You know, all we had to do is at the end of the day, it would just be OC exposed and then the service name and it would generate a, a route for you. Um, with an ingress, we have to generate the, the ingress itself. And so all we're doing is we're saying, hey, I want on this port, use this service, go to you know, this app, this is the, the URL, I want to get to it. And then same thing for port 80, if we wanted to allow port 80 access. All right, so let's give this a shot. We might get lucky and I, I'll probably have to fix something. Oh, snap. See, and that's what happens. You go back and forth to get, uh, so I, I aliased 
k. So k is kub cuddle. Uh, get pods minus n. All right, cool. So now we have our pod. So now let's do a curl. Cool. So now I'm going to stop sharing this and then hopefully we have the UI up. I'm sorry, I'm bouncing around a lot, but there's the only way to, to, to really show you what's going on. All right, so let's do And then obviously my cert didn't work. Why wouldn't it? But cool, just like that, deployed an application. So I, I know I talked a lot and I know I talked a lot about a lot of things and I'm sorry, cause that's crazy. Uh, and I just turned my video off. I meant to stop sharing. Uh, but I, as you can see, like with a, an OpenShift, and Kubernetes or using the CLI, like if I were to do the same thing in OpenShift, I would just do OC instead of kubectl. But to be honest, I could have used kubectl and just interacted with the OpenShift cluster in the same way. Um, but just so you can see the power of Kubernetes and OpenShift, right? Like it's it's super easy to deploy an application. It's it's easy to get from from start to finish, you know, and and really have that capability at your fingertips. And, and be able to spin things up and tear them right back down if they're not right. And then roll them out as you're upgrading and stuff like that. So there, there's so much power and uh, it's just, it's an awesome tool. I hope all of you guys get into it. Um, I know y'all are very, I think you're very AMI or AI ML focused. Um, and there's a lot of AI uh, uh, components that come with this as well, right? There's a lot of uh, integration with that we're working with uh, NVIDIA to, to get the integration down at the GPUs and stuff like that. So. Um, it's a it's an awesome it's an awesome tool thanks uh, thanks jonathan i think that was great